It's raw, it's no hoes barred. You better watch yourself, cause you might get bit. It's Dog Face TV, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Brought to you by Mogul State of Mind. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Hey, listen, world. My name is Dog Face Calderon. I want to welcome you all to the first episode of Dog Face TV live on YouTube. My name is Dog Face Calderon. Again, I want y'all to remember the name. Because of this merch coming as well. I want to start off with that. We're going to start with all the merch coming with the t-shirts, the whole broke ass bitches t-shirts. Everything is coming. So listen, in the inaugural episode of Dog Face TV, we break this show down into a couple of different segments, a couple of different sections where we all talking shit. We all going to enjoy ourselves, enjoy the conversation as it may. So listen, the first part of the show is called What's in the News? Uh, there are so many stories that... I'm seeing, I'm hearing, uh, we're living in real time now. We're living, we live in a world now, people where almost, I'm not really surprised or shocked about anything. Uh, I would be lying if I said I, I, I was shocked or surprised about any behavior or any activity that is displayed or committed by any of these niggas. Cause these niggas are niggas. And one thing we know about niggas is niggas going to do nigga shit. So speaking of nigga shit, Let's start off with Mr. Dwight Howard. Mr. Never lived up to his motherfucking expectations in the NBA. Um, one of the larger criticisms of Dwight Howard over the course of his career was that he was too soft. Soft. Keyword, soft. Uh, now we are finding out that soft in the play style of Mr. Howard doesn't just mean soft on the court. It may mean <laughs> that his booty was soft as well because in breaking news, Mr. Howard, and I don't really want to call this breaking news because for real, for real people, uh, I think that we as just fans of professional athletes, I think that we think that the things they experience, the things they go through, I think, I think that we tend to believe that they are, um, bulletproof from everything else that society as a whole goes through. Uh, homosexuality is, is something that is pervasive. Uh, it is something that is readily accepted in most societies on the face of this earth right now. Whether you agree with it or not, it is what it is. People love to live in their alternative selves. They love to do what they do. Some people are motivated by it for a variety of different reasons. Mr. Howard, on the other hand, uh, according to my report, Mr. Howard has been engaged in uh, some very nefarious activity. <laughs> it says that Mr. Howard liked to get a little sloppy toppy from the boys. <laughs> now, listen, I don't know if that's news because, hey, listen, in the world of professional sports, like I just mentioned before, we know that there are professional athletes who are homosexual. Um, we know that there are professional athletes who do all, who are drug addicts and everything else. They are able to hide it, and because the the sport and play aspect of the sport itself doesn't tend to accept just openly gay or homosexual people uh, without getting shunned, because it's like gladiator school. Like when you're on the football field or on the basketball court. You know, they, they want to put forth the, the ultimate man type thing, even though we know that behind the scenes, a lot of these motherfuckers like sneaker bars <laughs> with the nuts in it, with the chocolate and with the peanut motherfucking butter. We know that. So uh, when this story first came across my desk and I was discussing the shit with the producers, I, to me, it was like a non story because I, for one, know that professional sports athletes are not immune to everything that we see going on in society. So to me, it wasn't really a fucking story whatsoever. Who cares? Like Dwight Howard said, and what I do in my beer room, that's what I do in my beer room. Uh, who cares? What I do in my household is what I do in my household. I tend to feel the same way because we're living in the world now where people just do what the fuck they want to do. To me, non-story. Next, uh, let's move on. And we're not really moving on because in further breaking news, DJ Academics has run afoul of Saucy Santana, the sauce god, Mr. Saucy himself. DJ Academics weighed in on the City Girls' lack of unit sales first week of their album release. 
I haven't heard the project myself. I can't tell you why it did so horribly, but it is what it is. Some artists have up and down periods, but based on the the past success of the City Girls, 8,000, less than 10,000 units moved the first week. And we know that when we say unit, we don't actually mean CDs. A lot of times in the music business, when they, they package units. So it might be a video with the project. It might be a shirt, a T-shirt, or some type of memorabilia or merchandise they package with a unit. So the fact that they did so horribly, don't know why, but DJ Academics had something to say about it. He criticized the city girls and he questioned if they had the chops to make to, to, to continue. If they were he questioned whether they were still superstars. And when he did that, he made the sauce god, Mr. Shaky Booty himself, made him mad. Saucy Santana waited and he said, Hey, listen, academics, I want to fight you. I'll beat you up. And if I do win, if I do happen to knock you down or knock you out, penitentiary rules apply. Not for everybody, but Saucy Santana has obviously been in somebody's county jail <laughs> because he said, hey, listen, act, if I knock that ass out, I'm going to tap that ass. Now, if you, <laughs> I don't know if he was serious or not, but God damn it, I wouldn't put it past the Sauce Man. The Sauce Man is like a, he's, he's one of them types that seems like he will get in your ass. Literally, so hey, academics, I suggest you be careful. Don't you take your ass to Atlanta. And if you do, get your bodyguard. <laughs> Listen, and I don't know why we have another one of these issues. It's kind of like, like, I don't know why, but we want is Gabrielle Union, Dwayne Wade is a possible. We hear this is, let me hold on, let me hear Sp Splitsville between Gabrielle Union, according to what we see here. Miss Miss Union uh, is trying to break the fucking union between her and Dwayne Wade, Mr. Uh, Polished Fingernails. Uh, speaking of Dwight Howard, if we love the way we love Dwayne Wade, then we got to love what Dwight doing, too, because Dwayne Wade has displayed some rather questionable <laughs> motherfucking behavior. Uh, I'm not going to touch his son slash daughter. Uh, I'm not going to even put my whole beliefs in it, but it is what it is. Miss Union says she's going to cut out. Speaking of cut, I wonder if she's still partial to the cut or no. Hopefully they don't. Hopefully they don't. Hopefully they let that young man grow into and blossom into uh, whatever he's going to do. Once you get 18, if you want to cut your motherfucking uh, uh, your little toolie off, cut your fucking toolie off, brother. It's more bitches for us the heterosexual men who like women with big fucking titties. <laughs> By the way, hey, women with big titties, dog faces is a fan. Send me tick pics. You can DM me tick pics to my Instagram or you can send them wherever you, hey, listen, if you can find my number somewhere, send me all the tick pics possible. The bigger the tit, the bigger the tip. <laughs> the bigger the T-I-T, -T, the bigger the T-I-P. That's what they say. So listen, some more fruity ass shit. Jada, Pickett Smith and Will Smith. They are the clowns. They are the Ringling Brother Circus of Hollywood right now. I don't even really want to talk about just the activity of Jada and Will because that shit is so outrageous and so motherfucking outlandish. And that shit is an embarrassment that the activity of Jada and Will, when you consider they fucking superstar them, they just set black folk back. 40, 50 years with the shit they doing out there in Hollywood, man. But I was told that, that Hollywood is a whole different place, like a Twilight Zone. You you leave Baltimore, you leave Jersey, you leave New York, you go to Hollywood, and there's something about the water out there that's going to turn you into a little candy dipper. <laughs> and so, well, man, J.D. and Will, man, listen, man, I don't know what the fuck is going on with y'all, but I wish y'all get that together because, hey, listen, don't know real bitch won't will. And don't know real nigga won't Jada no more. Jada that whole Tupac shit. We over that shit. We you didn't fucked us up. <laughs> so we don't want to hear no more about no Tupac and making Will listen to Tupac music and when and you closing your eyes and thinking about this nigga. Hey, listen, Jada. Yo, you two characters, man. You guys, you guys belong with the movie. <laughs> and then further news. 
Cause I'm sick of this shit right here. He ain't got my motherfucking nerve. <laughs> Throw this shit out. I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> so listen, finesse two times. It's reported in the news that there may be trouble in Splash Town. Finesse two times. J J J Prince Jr. There is some rumblings that they just ain't getting along, man. You know how black we sick of black. We sick of you niggas. You niggas need to go to counseling. You rappers and you executives. I, I, you niggas need to go to counseling because we are absolutely fucking fed up with all this gangster shit going left and all this gangster shit going right. Come on, man. Get that shit together. Hey, listen, finesse. When you came home from prison, they flew you out in a private jet. They put jury around your neck. They put you in the position to win. Shout out to my man. Uh, what's the nigga name from uh, Alabama Mobile? What's the brother name? I what's the name? Honeycomb Brazy is his name. Honeycomb Brazy really plugged you in, man. So listen, I don't know what you're going to do, man, but I wish you guys down there in Houston because I don't know what the fuck is going on down there. But listen, Sauce Walker for governor. Sauce Walker needs to run for governor of the great state of Texas. The whole TSF clique, they winning. I'm just sorry. When I think about Texas now, I don't think about rap a lot, right? And I'm old. I think about what's going on there in Sauce Land. That, them, them niggas saucing like a muff, and they got all the bitches. You don't never. My clamor went blurred. All right, it's probably because of the microphone. Mm hmm. All right, from the Honeycomb Brazy part, right? All right, I got you. Let me know you're ready. Ready? And so I don't know what's going on down there in Splash Town with the whole mob ties, finesse two times, three times shit. But hey, listen, finesse, let me give you some advice, right? You don't want to fuck with Mr. James. You don't. I've never seen a human being, and I'm old as fuck, bro. I've never seen a human being go against the Prince family and come out on top of that shit. So if I was you, uh, finesse, I would stop that motherfucking finesse when you trying because that finesse don't work down there. James ain't, he ain't going for it. I suggest you sit your motherfucking little ass down somewhere. And if you're going to try to go at uh, uh, the Prince family, you might want to go to the gym, put the fucking donuts and, and, and honey, honey bun and put the zooms on. You ain't in prison no more, bro. Take your motherfucking ass to the gym. Be happy with the success you've had and respect the motherfuckers who actually put you in the position to win. That's just my take on that. Uh, <laughs> let me get rid of that motherfucking shit. Let me see. Uh, there we go. We ain't talking about that shit no more. <laughs> Don't get your fuck self fucked up, Mister Two Times. So listen, four two Doug, doggy's home. And further news: Detroit superstar artist four two Doug was released from lockup. He's back home. He came back home getting it. Bad jury doing what doggy does. I know Doggy. I've had the pleasure of meeting Doggy. Uh, I know Doggy's father. I know Doggy's family. Shout out to the whole motherfucking six mile to four two camp. It is what it is. I'm not partial to. I'm not crippled and blooding. I'm not four two versus this, that, and the third fifty five. And but hey, listen, man. Shout out to the whole city of Detroit. We are happy that Doug is home because he. It was it, like 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 Jiski said. They were abusing the young and turnt shit. They was young. But they want motherfucking turn. Y'all know what it is. Hey, listen, this has been the news segment. What's in the news? Motherfucking Dogface TV. Let's move on to the next goddamn thing. There are stories. Painful stories. And they're going to get told right here on Dogface TV. You know, I'm supposed to have a tribe. I never stole under day in my life. Never. It's time for you to get euthanized. In other words, you got to go. You got to motherfucking go. It is the segment of the show that everybody loves. You heard of Charlemagne the God's donkey today? Hey, listen. In the dog house, in the dog pound, we euthanize people. We have people who have been offenders of black culture, hip-hop, all things nigga shit. We have people who have offended the sensibilities of the Negro. And so, therefore, since you have, you have offended the sensibilities of the field niggas, you have been caught in the house with Massa, with Massa, Mr. Gilmo, Mr. Charlie. You have been accused of being Mr. Charlie's boy, not unlike the character. 
that Samuel L. Jackson played in the movie Django Unchained as Stephen Warren, Calvin Candy's faithful houseboy. And if you haven't watched the movie Django Unchained, I want you to know that the role Samuel L. Jackson played was a dastardly motherfucking character. He is like the villain of all villains of any fucking slave movie. He's worse than the white man. Uh, so he played the character of the foil of the plot. Had it not been for Stephen Warren, Django would have got out of there with the boxing Negro, saved him too, and he would have got out of there with his wife. That was the whole plot, 12000 for his wife. He interfered with it. Hey, boss, I think that nigga there know that nigga there. And that made Calvin Kenny think about what was going on, foil the plot, fucked up the whole plan. So listen, in episode one of Dogface TV, I got a whole list of motherfuckers here. But number one on my motherfucking list, let me check this nigga off. Royce the motherfucking five nine, aka five pennies. So listen, on a Breakfast Club interview a light year ago, uh, Mr. Five Pennies went, uh, being interviewed by Charlemagne and God and DJ Envy. I don't even know if Angela Lee Yee was there, but he was there. Doing the promo for his album Allegory, which by all accounts they say it was a dog ass album. I heard it pretty much dog ass album. However, he used T Grizzly as a major point of emphasis in the interview. Charlemagne the God, who we all know has questionable, he's been beat up so many times, man. But hey, no big deal because Charlamagne the God is a legend in the world of all things podcasting, all things radio. And so he asked Mr. Five Pennies, Mr. Nickel Nine, he asked him about a line in his song called Rhinestone Do Rags, where he said that I hate, quote unquote, uh, Roy said, I hate to see T Grizzly going through all the things he's going through. So that prompted Charlamagne to ask Royce what that was about. Royce went into a long diatribe where he described that T. Grizzly dissed Marshall Mathers. Uh, so he went into a long story about, hey, listen, he dissed you know, Marshall. So let me just back up. He, so he told a story of how Marshall Mathers, Eminem, called him and said, hey, do you think I ought to do a song with this T. Grizzly guy? Or do you think I ought to put him on a song? This is Royce's accounting of what transpired between him and Eminem. And Royce's response to him asked him, hey, you think I should do a song with the T. Grizzly guy? Or you think I should put him on a song? Royce said, yeah, but mm, hold on. Don't do it yet. Let's see if he's able to string together an, at least another or one or two of those hit records like First Day Out. Let's see if he's able to make that happen. And if he can make it happen, then that's good because it won't look like that his success is based on you just vouching for him by way of a feature or by way of a project like you did me when we squashed our beef back in the 2010-11 when we did Bad versus Evil, whatever the fuck that shit was, right? So I don't want you to give him the same kind of look you gave me, right? So <laughs> let's just wait. And Royce goes on to further state that while they were watching, we were watching T. Grizzly, watching it like the feds. Like the FBI, we watched this nigga behave. Never mind, never mind. <laughs> so listen, so <laughs> he said we were watching him, and then as we were watching him, T. Grizzly dropped his new album, came out with a song called No Talking or Not Talking. I think it was No Talking, and we're in which he stated, hey, I had to quit fucking with Dog because he's feminine. I run Detroit niggas talking about Eminem. And according to Royce, Eminem found that to be offensive and he took it as a diss. So he called Royce and said, hey, Royce, what the fuck, dude? He just dissed me. What? I thought you had control of these niggers in Detroit. How was this guy dissing me? And so Royce said, hey, listen, that kind of like burned the bridge that T. Grizzly didn't know he had. Now, come on. Let's back up for a second. Let, let's examine this shit. So, Royce the Five Nine, you are telling us that Eminem called you and he 
asked you, should he do a song with T Grizzly, who, by the way, was on fucking fire all across the fucking globe with that first day out song. Right now, I think first day out is at 300 million streams right now, or maybe 400 million streams. Don't know, but it was a fucking smash single. So I can remember when Drake jumped on Versace for the Amigos. I brought the Amigos to Michigan State along with Dita Don and Angela and fucking uh, Bianca. We, we, we brought the Amigos to Eastern Michigan College for a performance. And the Amigos didn't have any hit records really except for Versace and Rich and Famous. And But Drake jumped on that song long before he knew or understood where the Amigos eventually would end up. So when you look at the Cardi B's and you look at the fucking uh, Little Dirks, when you look at the fucking motherfucking uh, Nicki Minaj's, whenever somebody's hot come up, whenever a young dog who hot come up, they jump on the song. And it does two things. One, it helps pushes that new artist's career into the stratosphere. And two, it helps keep the older, more established artists relevant. So when you told Eminem, yeah, but wait, that first of all, I don't believe you said, yeah, but wait, but we're going to go back what you just said. You said, yeah, but wait. Okay, let's see if we can have make a couple of more hits like that. Okay, listen, I want you people to think about it like this. If that was your artist and the God MC of this planet, one of the most streamed artists in the history of hip hop. If he inquired about doing the song with your artist and you had somebody who was gatekeeping. Telling him, yeah, but wait, wait for fucking what? And not only did he tell him to wait when the so-called disc came out, which is a disc. What do you mean? What did he say? Oh, I had to quit fucking with dog because he feminine. I run Detroit. Niggas talked about Eminem. In my mind, that's not even a fucking disc, bro. And I don't think it was a diss in Eminem's mind who came from y'all looking at Eminem now, but Eminem came from the battle rap world where you have two human beings who stand in close proximity to each other and scream and yell obscenities and fuck yous and suck my dick and your mama's a whore and I know about your daddy and your baby mama's over here sucking cock. If you came out of that world, Eminem, how in the world could you look at him saying, I run Detroit, niggas talking about Eminem. That ain't no motherfucking diss. And even if he did really feel like that, Royce, as the OG you say you are, why wouldn't you try to massage that situation? Why wouldn't you try to say, hey, M, bro, you come from the battle rap world. Motherfuckers have said all kinds of shit about you, bro. And it just is what it is. And on top of that, M, you put out songs dissing your mama, calling her a dope fiend and whatever else. You dissed your baby mama on wax. Those songs went multi-platinum. So how could you be offended by him just simply stating, hey, nigga, I, I run Detroit now, not Eminem. In his generation, he does. He did. He did something for Detroit that the, the rank and file MCs of Detroit, he brought hope back. He brought hope again. He's a hope float man. So for you to do that, and then Royce, you went above and beyond that, and you mentioned him in a song that you are not telling the whole world that was like, get back for Eminem. So Eminem didn't say anything about it publicly. He never, he was never asked that question during the interview. He never commented on it. He never went, took it to social media where he said, hey, I feel like T. Grizzly dissed me. He never put it on a song. You just took it upon yourself to act like Stephen Warren from the movie Django. You jumped in front of the bullet for Shay Whitey, Mr. Gilmo. You, my dear friend have to be euthanized. We're going to ask some motherfucking lightning bolts of this shit. You know what it is. It's Dogface TV and fuck you. So listen, we're going to move on. This next segment is where I bring out somebody who I feel like has had a major impact on some aspect of society. Um, he is one of the most amazing athletes that this country has ever seen. He is, he was Mr. coming out of his senior year, uh, out of Youngstown, Ohio. Mr. Maurice Claret won Mr. Football the year he came out of high school. And then he eventually made his way to the Ohio State. Uh, university. don't worry. You know, I'm always dropping some shit, right? The Ohio State University where he went on to win the national championship his first year, ran motherfuckers down. And I'm from Michigan, so I was not a big Maurice Claret fan. 
But I have Mr. Maurice Claret here in the house. He's in the dog pound. He's going to talk to us. We're going to kick it. We're going to have a conversation. And <laughs> hey, listen, without further ado, man, let's bring Mr. Claret, Mr. Run Your Ass Down, Mr. Everybody in Michigan, whether you were a Michigan State fan or whether you were a U of M fan, we fucking hated him. We wish that he caught smallpox, chickenpox, measles, and the motherfucking monks. Mr. Claret, welcome to the motherfucking show. Dogface TV is in full effect. Mic check one two one two. Mic check one two one two. I start off like that, like I'm in the booth, like I'm finna rap or something, because we really finna have a conversation. We finna talk to each other. This is more, this is more of a conversation than it is an interview. Joining me today is one of one of America's most premier dominant run your ass down ass athletes. <laughs> that we've ever experienced. I'm from Michigan. So <laughs> the year that this gentleman, the, the time that he spent at uh, the Ohio State University, it was a tumultuous year for any Michigan fans because whether it was Ohio State or whether it was the U, U of M, the big house, my next guest, we had the plan, we had the game plan for him or else find your ass ran down <laughs> mr maurice claret is in the building how you doing brother i'm great great thanks for the thank invite you. thanks for the for the uh let me on the platform uh it's, it's my pleasure uh like i say i uh I'm a, I'm a football fan college and pro um the the the, the time that you spent at uh, the ohio state university is that how you say it too is you say the ohio state university yeah, but most people say the Ohio State, whatever you want. If Michigan whooping on us like they've been doing these right. last couple of years, right. they disrespect us, but uh, most people say right. the Ohio State. <laughs> okay, I got you. So uh, let's just talk about, let's start off with, let's start off with your early years in terms of how you developed into uh, the premier athlete that you are, right? The premier athlete that actually led you to uh, high school football fame and then college football you know uh fame can you tell me about your your beginnings w what city are you from what state are you from originally yeah from uh youngstown ohio man but uh oh, it's youngstown. pretty simple yeah from right. youngstown and football you know just like you a little kid growing up uh football is part of the neighborhood and i always say like man you don't you know you don't understand your gifted you're just playing rough and tumble in the front yard you playing neighborhood basketball you running track you're doing all the stuff that other little kids doing and actually, what really got me serious about football is that I got locked up as a juvenile. Okay. Uh, my third time getting locked up as a juvenile, uh, they was getting ready to send me to the state institution. It was called Tico in right. Ohio. And right. uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Roland Smith. I always tell the story. Uh, he was a correctional officer in the, in the institution, and he had seen me play mm -hmm. football in junior high. And right. he was like, man, if you take football serious, like, you know, you can kind of get out the neighborhood. You can do something else with yourself. And so on and so forth. And so it was the summer from my eighth grade to my ninth grade that I was on house arrest. And he took me every day lifting weights, kind of uh, get me in the, in, in the groove of what it's like to be a high school football player. Right. And from there, you know, uh, things just kind of took off. And so, you know, got into high school, um, you know, didn't really understand the game all well. Uh, but off of sheer talent, you know, over the first three or four games, had 100 yards here, 200 yards there, 150 yards here. And mm -hmm. I was like, man, I could actually do this thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And um, midway through my uh, freshman year, I broke my ankle. And this was mm -hmm. probably the most important decision I made. Uh, and I was saying high school, I ended up going to um, uh, transfer schools to go to a school that was a little bit more known and uh, having, you know, uh, sending guys to better programs. And so when I switched over there, uh, football kind of got taken a little bit more serious. Right. Had a coach, kind of, you know, sit me down and, and, and tell me that, you know, if you take this thing serious, you can – you know, potentially go to college and then, you know, ended up, uh, and I don't, I don't want to make it a, a long football story, but I uh, went from, you know, the, I always say like the juvenile system in, in, in junior high and in three years just taking something serious, you know, I ended up being a national player of the year in high school. And, right. uh, That's, okay. Good. I'm listening go to ahead. No, no, that story within and of itself is a testament uh, to if you have the will and you have the, the the presence of mind, you can take your circumstances, even though they may appear to be dire, and turn your life around totally. Yeah, and, and, and you don't know, like, I, I just always say, you know, 
you know, no matter who I'm talking to, whether it's you or anybody, I think a lot of times when you grow up in the hood, it's, it's a lot of guessing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And you think Absolutely. and you feel and you're like, man, can I do this? Am I special? Mm -hmm. uh, where does my talent really sit to what with like, you know, somebody from Michigan? I don't know what they do in Michigan or how they do in Michigan. Right. You really don't understand how good you are. Uh, but it's only through, you know, getting good coaching and then going out on the field and going to different camps that you be like, OK, this is where I stack up in regards to the guys in our region. Uh, but one thing I'll tell you that I, which was a clear decision, like, you know, you know, Detroit, Cleveland, all of these um, industrial sort of cities, they all have the same mentality. Right. Hard same work, mentality. old school. That's Absolutely. what we are. Right. And Absolutely. what ended up happening is when I started playing football, that was the big distinction where I had more of like a grungy mentality, hustler, mm -hmm. you know, not back down mentality. I was like, yo, a lot of people don't have that, you know, because they right. didn't grow up like that. They didn't they, they didn't they didn't develop that in the upbringing. And so I would say out of anything, my uh, my childhood or my younger years, when I got on the football field, that was the like the dog. You know, you got a dog in you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Absolutely. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, you said you got something right. else beside that somebody else don't have. Right. And that, and, and that, that mentality, that dog mentality is something that you can't buy. You know, right. It's something that's developed over a course of time, long before you even realize what your talents are. You have that innate ability in you and you don't even know it because it hasn't been born. It hasn't been brought into existence. It hasn't materialized. Uh, growing up in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, what was the city like when you were growing up? So just take the nineties and you know, the nineties are super violent, you know, super violent, you know, I could just remember crack on the scene. Uh, all of my cousins, my older cousins, hustlers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, known for hustling and going over to Western Pennsylvania and getting it in. And my older brother's moving out at 13, 14 years old. And, you know, I got some family members who know for just being super violent. And this was like the, this was my upbringing and what I'm around. And so, you know, when you're younger, you're watching it. And then as you start to emerge, you, you start to stick your toe in it. You're still in a car here. You break it in the house there. You 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 understand what you know buying work is and, and you're starting to get involved in it. And you know, I can't have this conversation on every platform, but following right. you, you understand what I'm talking about. Right. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. I understand. And and so for the most part, you're like you live in that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, in inner cities, crime isn't considered crime, it's just a way of life. Way of life, and absolutely. So, yeah. And, and so that's what, you know, the, the the majority of my childhood looked like, you know, had a great mother, you know what I'm saying? But at, it's at some point your moms can't do nothing for you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like like she at work and you outside and uh, love you to death and, and want you to do right. But what's going on outside is more important than, you know, whatever moms is telling you. And so um, as I told you, you know, I had a little football in there. The football kind of saved me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it kept me, um, after the third time getting arrested, it kind of uh, sheltered me in high school because now you're playing football and you're you're limited to what you can do, you know, just because you have practice all day and, right. you know, you're inside the system with people trying to push you along. But the childhood of it, right. you know, just wow, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, just, just, just you know, Youngstown, you, you know, same thing in Detroit. You, you, you watch same. people, get, watching right. people get murdered, watching people hustling. You know, uh, you know, trapping on a, every, every I ain't call it trapping in. It was dope houses back then. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. We a little bit old now. You know I mean? <laughs> it's trapped now. Back then, it was just plain old dope house, crack yeah. house. <laughs> right. And so that, that's what it looked like. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't, I don't say it to glorify, but I say it to like it's just the '90s. You know what I'm saying? Right. In the '90s, in, across the country, in, in any urban environment, it pretty much looked the same. Whether it yeah. was Detroit. A Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, I'm from Detroit, and so I, I grew up hearing about stories about Youngstown. I don't know if people from Youngstown, Youngstown know that, but people from Detroit understood that if you, because Detroit, Detroiters are known for like traveling with our illegal activities, right? <laughs> Youngstown, <laughs> Youngstown. I, I'm, a, I'm a, I, I've been there. I've been there too, bro. Youngstown, Ohio, was one of the cities that. When the discussion came up about should we go there to try to, it was like hell no because <laughs> them boys in Youngstown they they they, they want they, they want to fight they ain't gonna, they, you can't just go in Youngstown you got to know somebody you go up in there and play well, around if you want to. Well, I, I tell you, I tell you, we did have two legendary dudes, uh, Ready Rock Rick. These were kind of, these was guys from Detroit who basically right. and I was a kid then, but they they right. the ones who had brought 
crack down to Youngstown. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to blame Detroit for bringing Detroit. We're going to blame Detroit. We're going to blame. That's a, so listen, that's going to be. That's clickbait right there. We're going to blame Detroit for taking crack, introducing Youngstown, Ohio to crack cocaine. I'm sure Bill Clinton and what's it, Joe Biden would love to know that. You hear me? I'm sure Hunter Biden would have loved to have visited it. Youngstown, yeah, Ohio, Detroit. on that day. Yeah, all, all, I mean, but, but but these guys are legendary. You know, when you when you from the hood, like people don't like to hear it, but the people who you know, whatever cars they had, whatever women that they had, uh, however they was coming through, you know, back in the day, they was glorified. So when I was a kid, right. these guys from Detroit was in our city, and you know, they got love, and you know, when they got they did, you know, one did twenty seven years, the other one did thirty, and when they came back home, you know, you know, people loved them, respected them. They had kids with girls back there, so. You know, it's all love, but that's what I remember from Detroit right. dudes being in Youngstown. You know, Detroit dudes move around the hustle. That's what they're going to do. That's what we do. That's what we do for a living. Uh, so football was a saving grace for you. Um, so at, at what at what age did you realize that, hey, because I know you, you, you people, was it a situation where your coach, the gentleman who you spoke of, what was his name again? Roland Smith. Who introduced you? Who introduced Roland Smith? Did Roland Smith he saw something in you? How long did it how long did it take? How long did it take for him to convince you that you were something special? Well, what, what actually happened was like so I played little league football and all that, right? Right. And the, I probably should just uh like unpack the moment. So I got locked up uh in my eighth grade year, and he had seen me play in junior high. So right. he got me when I was inside of the juvenile institution. So he came, he was a correctional officer. He came and got me. And essentially what he said was, hey, man, let me go to the judge and see if the judge will put you on house arrest and you come to my high school and let me work with you, let me get you lifting weights and things of that nature. So he seen like the raw talent when I was playing a junior high uh, football gotcha. because he was a local high school coach who was like a, a strength and conditioning coach, but he right. was also recruiting like eighth graders into high school. Right. And so he was the one that kind of like put me on that path. Okay. And so he had seen me play junior high football. And so even, even when he put me on that path, I didn't understand what he's saying. I just was like, yo, I don't want to go to uh, Tico, which was the state right, juvenile right. institution. So I'll take the and football over that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll take that. Sign me up. Sign me up for that. <laughs> yeah. So right. that, that's what really pushed me into football and got me, you know, moving down the right path. And, um, and then once I start playing, I was like, oh shit, like, you know, like I can do this. You know what I'm saying? What was the what was the oh shit moment? Was it uh, the first breakout game? What was the oh shit moment for you? Yeah, so I I'm 14. And so even when you're 14, somebody who's 18 seems real old, right? Right. Absolutely. And so when you a freshman, you playing high school football, you think that these dudes are a lot better than what they are. Bigger, stronger, and faster. Big right. Absolutely. hundred yes, percent. So I go out the first game and I get 132 yards. And then the second game, I get 248 yards. And then the third game, I get 132 yards. And then we go up to Cleveland, and I get like 140, but I break my ankle. And I was like, yo, I can like, so it was like, I can go to college. Not that I can go to a big college. Not that I can go to the NFL. I just was like, I get to get the fuck out of Youngstown. You know what I'm right. saying? Absolutely. And, and, and so that was enough like, for you. That was enough. That, if, if at that point in my life, I was able to get out of Youngstown mm -hmm. and like just go somewhere else, I would have been like satisfied. And so gotcha. then I moved. And when I went to a, a school called Warren Harding, this is when they were playing like, you know, they were sending guys to Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, these mm -hmm. bigger schools. And so then when I started doing the same thing to these guys, I was like, shit. I was like, man, like, I think I got talent. <laughs> Right. Right. And, and so, you, you think you're right. Yeah. I think I, yeah. I might be able to do this shit. This is important though. So then right. the coach, I, I, I think like everybody needs checked at times. Right. And mm -hmm. so he was like, yo, Maurice, you're good, but you could be a lot better if you study the game. So right. I was like, all right, like, what are you saying? So he said, so at, at this point you were just, you were just dominating just out of sheer will and force without yes. even really being a student of the actual playbook. One one hundred percent, and so mm -hmm. he's seen it, and he was like, "If you actually take this thing serious, man, you can go ahead and do something with yourself." And so at this point, I was like, "All right, fuck it, let me take this thing serious." And so I start watching mm -hmm. film, and then he start taking me to the weight room, and he starts saying like, "Okay, these lifts will help you to get better on the field, and these lifts will help you break tackles, and this is how you keep people off your body, and this is how you get into the ice tub, and this is how you take care of your body." And 
this is how you play the game and you're going to get the ball 25 times. So learn how to run people over in the first half, learn how to droop them in the second half, learn how to be conditioned. So I had never heard that before. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. He's and giving so, you this cerebral aspect of the game now. Yes. And so right. now when I'm going to play my junior year, the game is slow because I understand what's going on. I'm mm -hmm. looking at it like a quarterback. And so uh, I go out and have a successful junior year. I come back my senior year and it was even, it was 50 times easier because now I'm in better shape. Now I understand the game. And now I know how um, the skullduggery of it right. Where now I'm like, I'm going to just run at you because you can't take that. And right. I'm going to intimidate you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know where I'm coming from? And so right. that, 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 now it's that, a mind that, game now. Now it's a Jedi mind game. You guys know me. You know my history. You know I'm coming. So I don't even, I can just act like I'm going to steamroll you and that's going to scare you because you know you're going to get punished if you touch me. Yes. So, and I give you this, right? So it's very easy and you can take this for anything in life. When people uh, compete privately uh, or like they're, they're shy about being direct, uh, everybody compete with so much force. But when you tell somebody, bro, it's me and you head on with each other and that's how you walking around mm -hmm. That forces whatever you are to bring that to the table. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And so when you when you when you collide with people, like we just gonna take all this stuff out the way, all these cheap shots out the way, all of everything out the way. When I'm mm -hmm. colliding with you in the first half and I'm running the ball, and I'm not scared of you. That's all premeditated to say, hey, bro, right. like you about to have a long night if you think that you're, yeah, about you're to sending a message to them. Yes, yeah, so your yes, your, your 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 offensive style, right? In terms of being like a ram. Rod is going to send a message to them. So in the second half, you already got them intimidated. They already yes. scared. They already tired and hurting already off rip. And you and you physically didn't put the work in in the off season to uphold this, right? right? So I didn't put these days in. I didn't go to your proms, your homecomings, your mm -hmm. special dances. I wasn't hanging out. I was like, you know, I was a gym rat. You know what I'm saying? I was I was on penitentiary time way in high school. Go work out, come back. Go work out, come back. Go work out, come back mm -hmm. in. You know, I moved out, like, I moved out my mom's house at 15 years old, right? So right. in high school, I'm staying alone in an apartment up in uh, Warren. And so right. I didn't have, like, the, the the anything. I was going to the uh, to the gym, coming back home, going to school, going to the gym, coming back home, going to the gym, going to school, coming back home. So just where my mind was at uh, was totally different than anybody who I was around. Got you. I understand. I understand. Um, <sighs> colleges was... Ohio State, and, and was it? I mean, because you're from Ohio, so was it a dream come true? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, actually, no. actually, I wanted to go to Notre Dame. It was it was really? Notre Dame in Michigan. Right. Who it, it had come down to recruit you. Yeah. No, so, so hmm. I actually committed to Notre Dame. Okay. And when they fired the uh, the head coach, I was like, I don't know who you all are going to go get. So I have to like reassess what I had going on. Right. And what ended up happening was Ohio State had uh, Jim Trussell. So Jim Trussell coached mm -hmm. at Youngstown State. And when he came to Ohio State and I seen the offense that he brought, I said, oh, I can go play in that. And Perfect then I match. looked at the guy. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and I just looked at the guys who were there and I was like, man, I can beat these dudes out. And that's when I decided to come. So it wasn't like, you know, this was like a dream come true. Always wanted to go here. Uh, I literally like and I'm, I'm telling you this. This is I don't know what day this is, but. Uh, as God is my witness, I never thought of going to the NFL. It was like, can I choose a college to leave my neighborhood to go? Like, so Notre Dame was more like, if I get a degree from Notre Dame, yeah. uh, I'll have a that, job somewhere. That yeah. means something forever, <laughs> right? Forever, forever and ever. Yeah. 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 And so that's, that's where it was at with me. I was like, man, if I go ahead and get a job somewhere, I'll be cool. You know, I won't never have an issue with, you know, with anything. And, and that's what I was thinking at the time. So Notre Dame was first on that list. And then when Trussell came, it was like the system that he played in and that he ran at Youngstown State. I right. knew that I could excel in that. Gotcha. Because you were familiar with it? Yeah. So, so we had ran in the high school. Um, okay. Like, you know, our, our, our high school coach, and just to give him credit, uh, his son was Josh McDaniels, the dude who just got fired from the gotcha. Rackers. Gotcha. But he's a legendary uh, coach who's a, 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 a an elite thinker, uh, a, a, a storied historian and champion throughout the state of Ohio. So he had prepared me very well. Like after I understood what he was trying to teach me and grasping it, like I was prepared. And so I said, man, I'll go to Ohio State and, and dominate these dudes. But at this time, like, yeah, think about it, right? I lived on my own for two and a half years. 
Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm grown. I'm, I'm out the hood. I got aggression. You know, um, you, you know what I'm saying? I just felt like there, there wasn't anybody who could stop me. This was, I was, you know, 17, 18 years old. Right. I got you. Uh, ha, 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 during that time, was there ever a situation where your aggressive nature or attitude, right, as it specifically related to football, did that transfer into other aspects of your life as well? Yeah, you know, just like I said, it, it, it's only certain stuff you could talk about, you know, on these platforms, right? Gotcha. So it's like, so times that I probably didn't get in trouble that it served me wrong, where, where, where you're testing boundaries, right? So I remember this was my senior year. I'm living by myself. And I remember I had a sheriff who came to me, was like, yo, we know you over here selling weed in this parking lot. Like, you're the mm -hmm. number one football player. Like, you should calm down and you just can't do what you want to. But it's like, yo, bro, like, we know. Like right. chill out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and then when I look back, I look back on that, and then I look back on just some of the people and 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 the aggressive mentality is in a neighborhood, and it's also in sports. It's the same thing, you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. But I don't think you know how to manage it when you're younger. And uh -huh. I, just, I I just remember being around scenarios and parties and shit. I really shouldn't have no business being around when you look at it like as an adult. Right. But I'm still around it because, like, my mentality is like, I'm playing, but I think I'm a street nigga. You know what I'm saying? Right. Got you. And, and it, you know, it's a lot like, you know, you, you can look at, what's his, and I, I don't want to jump off topic, but if you look at Sauce Gardner, he's from Detroit, mm -hmm. but his swag is a Detroit street nigga swag. Right. Even though he's not that, we all carry our environment. You inherit that because of the environment you come up in. Right. You mimic yeah, what you know. Yeah, and, and so as as you moving around and as you as you go on to play, the stuff that you channeling comes from your neighborhood. Right. The the I want to make it for my mother, or I want to get out the neighborhood, or I see my dudes struggling, or the the stuff that these dudes write on their sneakers, and they talking about rest in peace to my homeboy. All that stuff is just emotions, mm -hmm. and you get a chance to express it on the field. You know Absolutely. Coming from? Absolutely. And, and, and so I, I know that I don't have nothing. It, it doesn't encompass. It has those everything. No, 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 no. It has, it, it has everything to do. You're making my job easy as an interviewer because you're already <laughs> pre fully prepared, right? Because these are the kind of see, the, the, the issues and the subjects you're touching on are issues and subjects that young people who are in similar situations can learn from because these are the nuances about how people become great. Right. These are the things that people that don't really get discussed or talked about. Right. When, he, when, he, when if you're a student or of Maurice Claret in his career. Right. Sometimes you don't understand the journey. Sometimes you don't understand the mentality that it took to get to where he is. Good, bad or ugly. Right. Yeah. And then sometimes when you tell a full story, you give you give girth to it. It, it puts things in perspective for somebody else who may be going through a similar situation that you went through or, or I went through or anybody. Because I come from the streets as well. I was on vacation for a long time, brother. Trust me. <laughs> right? You hear me? I was on vacation. I went to penitentiary at 21. I came home at 38 straight. So I get it. I've been there and done that. Uh, yo, when you got to Ohio State, you understood that it was a similar system uh, in terms of playing system that you were used to. Did you know? Was it was so you knew by the time you left? High school, you knew that you were you you were dominant. You couldn't be stopped. Did you feel yeah. the same way going into college? Did you know I'm finna go here and I'm going to dominate at this level? Were you that confident yeah. going into college? Yeah, supremely confident. And a lot had it, it was two things. So one, um, I've always been a, like if, if I, I'm, I feel like I'm a fairly decently intelligent guy, right? Mm -hmm. So even though I'm from the hood, I've never learned like structurally through books through school. I've right. always felt like I've had the ability to process information well. So right. understanding the football game, that was like, I was like, okay, I understand this. I'm coming into college. I'm squatting 800 pounds. I'm bench mm. pressing 440. I'm hanging clean to 380 pounds, right? Mm. So in regards to my peers, I'm strong as a motherfucker. You know right. what I'm saying? That's and then as you coming in 800 pounds. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. but, but like just, that's but, a small I, car. That's a compact car nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but I took it serious. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I, that's, that's more or less what I'm saying. Like I wasn't playing any games. And when I come on campus and when, even when I took my official visit, as I'm seeing these dudes, 
it's no difference than anywhere you go. Like you can size somebody up just by looking at them. Like, mm. like, you know, just to, like the playful nature of dudes right. or I'm going to just tell you like, so one dude, he cared about women too much. Right. Like, so as soon as I seen him, he want to be cute all the time. I was like, I got him. You know what I'm saying? Got got and then the other dude, he was out of place because he was from, uh, from California and this is no knocks to him, but he just wasn't comfortable being here. He right. felt like a loner, you know what I'm saying? Right. And then the other dude, he didn't want any contact. So like I had done my research on these dudes, just like right. Oh, and they, these are the people who you're competing for a position against. Yes. Okay, I got so, you. And th this is how, and, and I said with all due respect to him, this is how I sized them up, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh man, I check all these boxes, and then my my entire um, what people was drawn to me by was just my aggressive nature, right? Right. So I said, okay, I just need to get on special teams. And I need to be aggressive on special teams just to send a message to the team, right? right? So I would get on special teams and, you know, I'm running down the football field on special teams and blowing up the wedge. I'm doing punt block and blowing up the personal protector. I'm right. doing drills and just making contact to let people know, like, this dude really want to play. You really want to play. And, yeah, from, from there, you, you like, it, it, it's certain things, no matter what you do in life, I don't care if it's business, I don't care if it's this media space, like just brute force can push you into spaces that intelligence can't, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and absolutely. And, and, yeah. And, and so for me, it was like, man, I, I can, I'm not about to sit here. I ain't come here to sit. I just need to let these dudes know what time it is. And I didn't vocalize it. I just was like, I'm about to let, just let these dudes know. And it was just day in and day out. And I would do things like, well, fucking with them. Right. So I was like, these niggas going to show up late or these brothers going to show up late. Right. And, or, or not, not late. They just gonna do just enough. So just I would, enough. Beat, I would beat these dudes to the field. I would warm up before them, and I was fourth string on the depth chart. But I would get in front of them on purpose just to see if they said anything. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, did they? No, no. But that's that right you know what time it was. Right. Absolutely. You, you, you don't want this. Yeah. No, nah, they, they don't want it. Or, or mm -hmm. after we done. I'm going to lift the weights to extra times. You know what I'm saying? So I'm exercising after practice. I'm doing this before practice. And I've always understood, like, even as a kid, somebody can be good for a short period of time, but it's extremely hard to do it over a journey, over a Yeah, long period of time. Absolutely. Yes. People lose, so, people lose focus. They lose motivation, right? <laughs> and they lose the will to actually want to achieve. And they lose focus on what the prize is. 1,000%. And eventually these guys just started to fall off. And then uh, we in the film room, and this is another thing, and this is just for anybody who may have kids coming up or it's kids who may watch this. You never know who, who's going to tune into this. The whole act of like learning what the coach is complaining about when he's coaching those guys up. So he'd be like, man, you, you know, you're not running the ball and having much contact or, mm -hmm. you know, you're not using your hands or you're not pass protecting well. So all those things I would just log in the back of my brain. I said, okay, I'm not going to have him complain to me about that. You know a what I'm saying? second time. If it's the first no. time, it won't be a second time. Gotcha. Yes. And so I would learn from Nate coaching. And then, but I also knew, I said, man, the thing that these dudes, uh, the thing that these dudes can't do is they can't get aggressive. And right. that was like their their downfall and in, in like the whole deal. Gotcha. Uh, so when you finally get to, how long did it take you to get into a starting role at Ohio State? Uh, two weeks before the first game. Two weeks before the first game, so you went to the first game as a starter. Well, who yeah. was surprised by that? Nobody. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> nobody. The, just based yeah, on what you just, the, nobody surprised by that. No, the, the teammates weren't, but the uh, the fan base was like, "Yo, like, what are you doing?" But after after the teammates had seen me, like, I had earned all they respect, and um, you know, they wanted me in there, and the coaches wanted me in there, but the fan base they had never seen a freshman start running back at Ohio State. Right. Right. So that was an anomaly to them. All yeah. right, so you get into Ohio State, you move in the groove, and we're, 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 we're so you, I know you articulated the fact that you were extremely focused, and then you mentioned one guy who was just too caught up with women, right? Was there, mm -hmm. was there ever a situation where, how long did it take after the first, what was your stats after the first game? That, that's what was the first game? After the first game, the whole, everything just started. You know what right. I'm saying? No more doubt so, in the coach. No, so after the first game, and if we talk about the women aspect, you know, I was just Joe Blow on campus. You know, I had me a little girl I was messing with, but it was that. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't like exactly. um, everybody's favorite. I wasn't getting no groupie love. But my first game, I ran for 175 yards and three touchdowns. 
And I remember we went to a uh, club after. And when I get to the uh, the little club we at, you know, everybody know you, but you don't know everybody. But right. now the access to, you know, whether it's women or whatever it was, it was just on it was on deck. But I, but I also say this, too. Before I went to Ohio State, I was like kind of doing my own thing in like this isolated places, go to school, go to work out and then come back home. But I remember my first game, all the niggas from my neighborhood come down. Like, it's like right. fucking 30 of these niggas. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so then when I'm done with the first game, they didn't know I was going to have success. Now we out. And right. right. And that's what I say. Like, you can't speak to everybody on every platform. And I think only from watching interviews of you, you'll get it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so I go to, um, you know, we come to the club and it's just like this duality. Right. So I know I'm a football star, but. I equally so you had you good. you had the presence of mind. You knew that you were a football star. You knew that. I, I knew that because of what I did on the field. But I'm right. also Mister Important to my homeboys from back home, gotcha. and that felt as equally as important because all these dudes who converge from Youngstown, I get to go out and host them. And it sounds so shallow now, but you walk up in a club with like fucking thirty niggas, you feel like. You feel like you got some power, you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Absolutely. And, and, and so that's prize. Became, you're the gym. Everybody gotta protect you, right? Yeah. You they way out, so to speak. Yes. Right. Your but, relationship. But you, but, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Right no, no, no. Go finish it. Finish your thought. Oh, just the just the the you have if you if you're talking about young people learning, you have to understand that thing is just as addicting too. Right. You know what I'm saying? Being the guy amongst the people, being the guy amongst people who hustling, being the guy amongst people who putting in work and, and being that being that centerpiece, that was as if I when I look back at it, that was as equally as a great feeling as me going to score 175 yards. And I don't know, you know, how how you you know how you play that back differently because you grow up in it and you want to be important to your friends. But you know, that's that that's what happened, or that's what kind of started everything going the way it did. Got you. You won Mr. Football. Your senior year of high school, right? LeBron run mm -hmm. won Mr. Basketball. Was that the same year that you guys won? No, those? He, he, he's a year younger than me. A year younger than you. Did you know LeBron growing up? Yeah, you, uh, I, I, met he, I'm, I met LeBron when I was in the 11th or 12th grade, and they had uh, like so he was like he. You got to remember he 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 um he won a state championship his ninth, tenth. I think he lost one year and he won his 12th grade year. Don't quote me on that, but right. he was a mega star like when we were in high school. He was younger than me, right? right? right. So they were selling out um, uh, fucking high school arenas, bro. Like right. these motherfuckers are going to college. Like it was like it was the NBA team. Yeah, so, so they would move the high school games to local college arenas. You know what I'm saying? Really? Yeah, really? So, so, you, so you would get, you know, probably six, seven, eight thousand people which is a lot of people stuffed in these high school or these college gyms. Absolutely. To watch just to a watch high play. basketball game. And, and just right. let me tell you about my circumstance. So he's coming to Youngstown. I'm like, you know, who is this? I go to the game and like, just talk, you talk about like serendipitous or you talk about fate. The only seat that I see open is, um, I didn't know it at the time, it was by his mother. So right. I come in, I sit down and I'm watching the game and there's people coming up to me asking me for my autograph and asking to take pictures uh, while I'm in, in high school. And right. she's like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Maurice. And she's like, yo, that's my son, LeBron. And I right. was like, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? And right. so it was an old shit team. moment. <laughs> yeah, so, right. I get you. I yeah. understand. She was the one right. who actually connected us. And then after he got done with the game, uh, I ended up going to the, the locker room and we met right there. And then um, everybody you sort of see around him now, like I was um, – around when all those guys first came together. You know, so there used right. to be a couple other people, but uh, around that time, that's kind of like when we connected and hooked up, and um, that's that's where it started. That's where the relationship started. Gotcha. Do you, do you, do you, are you guys still in communication now at all? No, it's like, so it's like phased approach. So we were in communication prior to me getting into a lot of my trouble, right? Gotcha. And so, like, like I, so I'm, I'm mature and I understand it, so... You have to figure this was I started getting in trouble in 2002, three ish. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I had mentioned this before. I've mentioned it like a thousand times over. Like he even in high school, he knew that he was an entity. You know what I'm gotcha. saying? He knew that like uh, just this thing about this. You sign for 90 million dollars and going to your first year for a Nike contract. Sure. Absolutely. You, 
you you sign for juice batteries, you sign for Coca Cola, you sign for all these things. And so me, I had that level of awareness, you know, of what was going on around him, right? Gotcha. And even though I love like my nigga shit at that moment, I also understand that this ain't for him. You know what I'm gotcha. saying? And gotcha. you know, at this time you had Worldwide West was around him and Aaron and all these people who you knew it was like a different thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so when I got in trouble in, in 03, just the, the track of my life, like this dude going to play in the NBA and he got games to play and all this, all that. And so there was some separation right there, but it wasn't like personal. It was just like, yo, I'm going to do my thing. Right. Gotcha. And so over the years, I get out of prison and I reconnected with Rich and I reconnected with Mav. And these are all the dudes that you see around them. And it's all love. And I was in New York with Mav and Steve Stout and and, and when they did the movie premiere and right. they had a movie that came out that's more than an athlete. So we was all together and hanging. But I just understand that, you know, like just, just certain points in people's lives, bro, like just what you're doing right now don't fit in with what I got going on. You got know you. what I'm saying? Got like, you. You, got you, you. I understand. <laughs> I got you. Jim, Jim Trussell. Jim mm -hmm. Trussell. What was your relationship like with him can you talk about that at all yeah you know it was it, it had its moments you know says so you 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 first start out as like you know you were this legendary coach at ohio state and then you go through a moment where you feel like uh you, you won the championship and then y'all close mm -hmm. and y'all both have accomplished more than you've ever thought you will and then when i get suspended and you know this part part ignorance and part just like not understanding how things really work, right? Or, or just mm -hmm. like you're in a bad situation. And what I'm what I'm talking about is um um when when everything happens at Ohio State, and when things sort of like you know go away or go sideways, uh, I was like, yo, like I thought that you had more juice than what you had to kind of help right. me out of the situation. And that and was your that, that was your thought process as things were starting to unfold for you. Yes, and so gotcha. what ended up happening was he um. You know, he um, I thought that he had more juice than the athletic director. And mm. so I didn't understand it was a board of directors. Then the hierarchy. The, the, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. It, ignorance doesn't allow you to see it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So what ended up happening was like we fell out and I was like, yo, bro, I thought you could have helped me in a situation. And you knew that like I was trying to uh, protect everybody that was going on. And he was like, yo, bro, like I'm like, I don't have as much power as you think I do. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And then it wasn't until I lost everything and I went to prison and you sitting and you reflecting and you looking at like, yo, bro, like don't blame this dude for you fucking up or right, don't yeah. blame this dude for like the decisions you made to do the nigga shit that you was doing. And I think that's gotcha. just like maturity. Gotcha. So so listen, was, before what? we get into that, brother, please. I want to, because I, I don't want to travel too far down this road, right? Before we talk about you winning a national championship, <laughs> your your first year in college, what did that do? Did that did that what did that do to you psychologically? Did that make you like? Did it, was that a part of what? Because I, I have a feeling, and and I follow your story, right? So was that? I know it was a good thing because. That's something they could never take from you. You were the person who, had it not been for you, no national championship that year. That's a fact, right? Yep. Did it did, did it add fuel to a negative side of your psyche from a mental yeah. standpoint? Yeah, did so, it make so you I feel like you're more invincible and you couldn't be yeah, touched? Yeah, so I, but what, no, 1,000%. One, 1, like, so just imagine that you're in a major city and nobody tells you no. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like and that was the situation. Being, yeah, like you, right. you have to figure, right? So there's fanatics in Michigan. It's fanatics in Ohio. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. And so people who are around these programs, bro, um, they like, yo, this is the most important thing in the world. So you got this kid who's come here and has like blown up on the scene and has mm -hmm. like, brought this championship here right? right so then like at this point like i can i can only describe it like i'm a young nigga too you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying like and, and so i don't i don't want to go party or hang out with the dudes on campus i want to hang out with the niggas from youngstown who hustle who come down right. here right and who have all like, the trappings already yes right yes and so what ended up happening is now i'm thinking it's funny and cool that you know we can either go to clubs or we can mess with girls and it was just like human beings need boundaries. People don't like to say it, but you need 
Like you need people Absolutely. around you. Because our nature <laughs> is to do bullshit sometimes. <laughs> and when there, when there are no boundaries or parameters, when there's no guardians or watch, watchers over the shit we do, we will, we will, we will, we will live in our lower self. But we you, will, you fucking, we will live, in, live self. in our lower self. The, yeah, so there has to be a system of checks and balances put in place, so, or or at least we find ourselves committing all kinds of shit that ain't right. So just think about this. So imagine yourself, juvenile system in 98, 99. Mm -hmm. You go three years from that, you're the champion of the world. Like we talking about right. Youngstown, Ohio, like nigga right. out the hood. And then within 13 months, you go win the national championship. Right. And so I don't care who you are, if you're not grounded or have a support system to kind of get you from guide you through that. Right. Yes. And so that's where, 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 where you say this forceful nature, where I have it and I want to go, 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 go. If you had guidance in front of you, they could have guided that, that nature, right? So let, let's right. take this for example. This is a true story. When I was out with LeBron, I remember this was one time we were downtown in Cleveland at the Mirage. We were both too young to be in a club, but we in the club, right? Right. And so I'm in a club, and this is – now think about this. This is 18. He's 18, 19 years old, however we are. He comes in the club. He has the Muslim guys as a security. He has uh, his managers and his team with him. But me, on the other hand, I'm a year older than him, and I have a bunch of niggas around me. But I got access to the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. And I'm in a party like, yo, take this uh, Malibu and pineapple. He like, nah, bro, I'm cool. Like, I got to work out in the morning. I got to go do handle my business. You feel where I'm coming right. from? And that and was his mentality. He, but he had the people around him too, around like, him to help support that and help buttress that. Boo, get out of here! You know we ain't doing that. You, you feel where I'm coming from? Right. And so in the moment, I'm thinking like, man, this dude on some bullshit. Like, right. party, have a good time. But nah, he 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 had enough people who had enough sense to put him around him. Me at that moment, I wasn't letting that be around me because it was slowing me down. From it was strict you. To Right, yes. absolutely. And absolutely. So you, you don't you don't learn until you you look back on it, you be honest with yourself, and you say, "Hey, at this moment, had I played this a little bit different, you know, maybe things would have turned out, you know, differently in my situation." Gotcha. My name is Dollface Calderon. Mr. Maurice Claret is in the building. The arch nemesis to anybody who's from Michigan. I don't care where <laughs> you're from in Michigan. You we we hated you, brother. <laughs> did you did, did you feel the hate coming from Michigan? Because I I think we were, I, were, I was a part of the seance. <laughs> I was wishing you to catch chicken pox, right? <laughs> Will you please give this man chicken pox before he comes up to Michigan State or the big house? Um, do you believe what? So the the first trouble you got into. Was it after the national championship when you started to experience some of the trouble that led to you leaving school? No. So, so what, what really happened, um, it wasn't even trouble. So I was, I was, I, I, I used the car. The, the big, the big thing that happened with me in Ohio state and that eventually got me in the trouble was one of my homeboys got killed in a drug deal going bad. Right. And at the national championship, I wanted to go home for the funeral but they couldn't explain that the guy wanted to go home for the funeral was it like was caught in a drug deal going back. Right. They didn't, they didn't want that around. They didn't want that headline. Right. No. And so that's when we first start beefing. So then there was a car that I was and using. And the beef was between you and Jim Trussell. That was the, the athletic beef? director. The athletic, athletic director. director. Gotcha. Yes. So he told me I can go home for the funeral. They didn't allow me to go home. And then there was uh, like a media day that came out. And I said, like, the university lied to me. And so I'm not. Oh, during media day, you said this out loud. Yes. Oh, and so okay. remember that forceful. You needed a publicist. You needed a publicist at that point. Yeah, because you're planning to be <laughs> right. You needed to go between. You need a liaison between you and the athletic director. Right. But, I got but, just, but think about where we come from. If somebody. Mm -hmm. Where we from is a liar. You can call them for what they are. Right. I'm not really understanding the politic of it all. I didn't understand that, but I'm thinking like, man, this dude ain't about to do this to me. But again, that forceful nature, like it'll help you on the football field. But mm. you, know, you have to distinguish when you can and can't, you know, operate the way you want to operate. Right. So the next thing you know, uh, he was like, um, that's when the that's when. Man, we got to get him out of here started, right? So then right. I had a um I had a car that got broken into and I had the car illegally 
And the next thing you know, once the car got broken into, the NCAA had came in later on that year to investigate me. And the next thing you know, he was basically serving me up to the NCAA saying, hey, man, like you can go ahead and suspend this dude any way you want to. And to make a long story short, they end up suspending me indefinitely. And that's kind of like where like shit went south for me. That's nice. when I'm like, man, like. Uh, so you were suspended from the team or from playing in the NCAA anywhere? Anywhere, anywhere in NCAA, you, you're suspended. You're no longer in the game. And mm -hmm. so this is like, and, and this is more like just a, a, just a mature conversation, right? I've never experienced depression before. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what it was. And so I remember like, they like, uh, yo, you can't play. And I'm like, all right. So like, I take my eyes back to the house and I'm like, man, what the fuck do I do with myself? Right. And you know, you're depressed when you keep on playing the same thoughts over and over and over again. And I keep on thinking about this moment. So Monday going by, Tuesday going by, three, mm -hmm. Wednesday going by. And I keep on replaying like this bad thing that happened. And I'm starting to feel like a victim. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And uh, everybody fucked me over and fucked this person and fucked that person. Right. And so that's the way it started. Right. So then this forceful nature. Now I had these dudes who I used to be ripping and running away. And also, okay, I got these you know Hispanic brothers that's in town and, they know I'm around dudes who hustle. So, man, fuck it. I'm about to just go on the streets and hustle because I don't have to be in class anymore. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. And that's where... You were suspended from school, not just the team? I'm, I'm, I'm suspended from the team at first, but gotcha. I have all this free time. You know right. what I'm saying? I got this free time. I'm in Columbus. Uh, everybody knows who I am. So I got to go to practice. Let me go out and, you know, have sex with these girls. Let me go out to the club on... You know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. You just totally lost focus because you don't have what you normally do in play anymore. Yes. And so mm -hmm. the same dudes who was in town with you now, these dudes hustle. You know what I'm saying? These dudes get it in. And then now I got access to dudes who get work cheaper in Columbus than the, the guys in Youngstown. And so this is how gotcha. every this is how everything happens at this time. And so right. now, you know, you start. You know, you take half a joint and then they give you a joint. And then the next thing you know, it's 40 going north and you're supposed to be focused on the game. But now the street fame and got a hold of you. You feel what I'm coming from? Gotcha. And then now Absolutely. you ain't you ain't you ain't Reese coming back home the football player. You Reese coming back home with the bag moving work with the gotcha. bag. You feel what I'm coming right. from? And so now that's where this this mentality starts to develop. That, you know, yo, bro, you ain't the football player no more. You the street nigga who you wanted to be. Okay, I got you. So during your journey, as things started to go left for you, uh, was there any, because I hear you tell the story that you were around just people who was hustling, so you fell back into the hustling mode. Was there anybody amongst those hustlers, even though they were hustling, was there anybody amongst those hustlers who had the presence of mind to try to try to convince you, hey, listen, bro, you might be in trouble now? But you can recover this shit. You're you just you won a national championship. You're a great. Was there anybody who tried to convince you not to go back towards the hood, but to, to towards the streets? Yeah. So when I went to California, yeah, okay, that was um that was when I got around people who were trying to put the brakes on me, right? But right. so much had happened before okay, cool. then. Um, I I don't want to say I was fighting it. This is what it is. Hey, listen, so we were talking about or the, the, were there any influences, were there any people who saw the like you're going to the left, but who understood like, whoa, whoa, motherfucker. <laughs> Hold yeah. up. Yeah, the, right. the biggest part was California. And I had a homeboy who I was around with at the time in California who was trying to, you know, get me focused, get me back on the right track. And like I, I would be focused maybe 40% of the time, you know what I'm saying? But even the California lifestyle had caught me. You know, so I'm, I'm in L.A. I come out here. I got a few dollars with me. And then, like, I'm just caught up into the L.A. lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I just got to say that you know, the, the wheels were off um, leaving Ohio State. The wheels was off when I was uh, ripping and running the streets and getting the feel of what getting money in the streets feel like on, a, on what I thought was a large level. Right. And by the time I get to California... I feel like, you know, like anybody who's come from the Midwest to go to L.A., you get to Cali, you experiencing it, you loving it. And, and right. that's a whole different world within itself. And so, um, you know, that's, that was like, you know, the, the couple of years I was out of football before I went to the NFL. That's what I was doing. Right. So and I want to touch on the on the on the NFL journey. Uh, so you were like you were the first player in history 
to try to challenge the exception to get into the NFL after your first year? You, is there an is age limitation? And there's yeah, so, a year limitation as well, right? Yeah, so you have to be three years removed from high school. Got you. And so what happened was um, Jim Brown had came to me and he said that they can't stop you from working due to labor laws. Right. And uh, when we initially tried to uh, challenge the NFL, these guys were like, yo, like uh, the judge who was in New York, I don't know whatever district court she was in, she, like she approved of it, right? And or you seen that I got resistance was all of the people who benefit from the sponsorships of the collegiate level, right. all of these people collectively came together, uh, had representation and said, nah, you're not about to fuck this up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And if you do it, if you get away with this, it's going to open up the floodgates for other players. And so that transitions into, right? And I'm sorry for cutting you off, but that I'm transitions right. naturally into what we see happening now in collegiate sports with athletes having the opportunity to earn a living. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk about how you feel about I mean, So because of what we see now with college athletes being able to get endorsements and able to make money using their image and likeness and like taking ownership of their image and likeness, does that play into your mindset at all based on what you went through? No, I, I think like it's, two, it's twofold. I think if I was at a different place in life, I may feel bitter or slighted. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the fact that I've, you know, I've I've grinded and got myself back up and do what I do now, I think that Absolutely. plays a part in it. And you're a little bit, you're older, you educate it, but then you also understand that, like, no, no matter, it, it's just like dudes with weed, right? If you if you locked up for weed and now right. you see everybody selling weed, everybody legally, the judge smoking weed, the judge who <laughs> sentenced you, he 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 smoking weed. Yeah, but but you right. you have to accept that when it was your time to get it in. Um, but, but, you know, I go to a lot of these colleges and I speak. And so you understand where these dudes come from, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And everybody won't make it to the NFL. So if a dude can get an NIL deal and able to put some money in their pocket, they can help their moms. They can just help their situation. You get into something out of the deal. So I feel like just my role in this, like my circle of life moment is educating guys what they're actually in. Or saying, hey, man, as you're looking at this deal, think about taking equity positions if the deal is large rather than taking a single check right now. Right. Or this is how you market yourself and make yourself marketable. Or if I'm advertising to them, um, like just because I've made money, you know, millions through entrepreneurship, I can speak and talk and give direction through how you make money, how you leverage your brand. Gotcha. So. I'm at that phase with, with all of it and saying, hey, man, you know, mm -hmm. you can do well for yourself. And, and no matter if the NFL works out or not, leverage this moment. And so I like mentally I'm in that space with that that entire conversation. Got you. So listen, so is it like a bittersweet? Because listen, there, there are people who thought that after uh, after what happened in college with you. Right. And then subsequently. Uh, getting locked up, getting in trouble, getting locked up. There were people who thought that you were not going to be able to bounce back. Did you did, did you did you get that type of energy from people? Yeah, but but that's what ultimately drove me. You know what I'm saying? So like that that people have every right. This is what I don't think people understand. Like when you're a public figure, people are gonna praise you, they're gonna criticize you. You don't like when they criticize you, but they have the right in the space because like, that's, that's you. That's what you do. You benefit mm -hmm. from it. You get, you get negative remarks about it and you have to deal with it. Right. right. And so I think when you younger, well, what happened with me, I can't say what I think what happened with me was the, the negative stuff beat me down. I think it's like the cycle of maturity where you get beat down and everybody talking shit about you and everybody boo hooing you, but you've been locked up and you had a moment with yourself where yeah. you say, man, fuck this. Like, this ain't about to be the end of my story. Like, I'm about to take ownership of this shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, when I, and that, when I and tell my story, happened. when I tell my story about how I, I, I've been home since 2009, right? And when I tell my story, one of the things that I, one of the things that I say is what you just articulated, right? I didn't want, I didn't want my children. I didn't want people who, who loved me and believed in me. I didn't want, I didn't want there to be a period after my life just with being, going to prison. Right. Mm -hmm. And so every one of the things that motivates me, one of the things that, that, that keeps me focused, even when even during the times that things get a little blurred for me, is that I want to be 
I, I want to be as great as I possibly can be. I don't want to be just an average ordinary nigga. I don't want to, I don't want the last thing you thought about me or think about me is that I've been in penitentiary where I got in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one of the things that kind of like drives me the most. And the naysayers and dollars who said I wasn't going to be shit with a dope fiend, alcoholic, uh, in the penitentiary or dead. Right. Yeah. The fact, the fact that I'm not one of those four things, I'm shocking a lot of people, even people in my own family. Yeah, but but it's it's the, it's the same thing. So everything that you just named, that's what they thought would result to my life, right? Right. And so, um, not to not to jump too far along, that's what you have to internalize and sit with those feelings and deal with it, and say, okay, how am I going to deal? With like one, how do I deal with myself? And then how do I deal with this shit that's coming towards me, right. being negative comments or whatever it is? Right. And ultimately, man, I'm telling you, my driving force. And even living in Ohio and just how I move around, where I don't have to say shit, like it, it's pretty clear where I'm at in life. You know what right. I'm saying? And that is the greatest joy for me. That's some get back for that, ain't it? Yeah, it, it, that's and you get back. Yeah. Even though, even though we put ourselves in situations like this, right, right. So we 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 eat that shit, but it's some get back for yeah. It feel pretty <laughs> fucking good, buddy, right? Yeah. Because you thought. <laughs> you sons of bitches thought that this shit. No, bro. See, that speaks. See, I've I've learned how to trans. I've it's like fuel. I've turned that gasoline, that propane shit, into some E eighty five, right? <laughs> so I can. I took that shit that you thought was gonna make me. No, I I refuel. I, now I'm a, I'm an electric car now, bro. I'm a Tesla now. I was an old Crown Vic, but now I'm a Tesla. That uh, y'all tried it, you know? so. <laughs> How how do your family and friends feel about you now on on this side of your journey? Well, it's twofold. Um, well, the first is this: the biggest thing and the biggest person who I felt like I let down that I redeemed myself with is my mother. Gotcha. So, bar none, man, just being somebody that she can be proud of, like that was my biggest thing, right? Gotcha. And then there was people along my journey coaches or just people who invested in my journey, giving me books, a couple dollars to have in prison. I'm happy for that. Um, a lot of the friends from before, I don't have bitter feelings towards because I understand they still in a journey, you know what right, I'm saying? Right. But we just, we just don't like, there's no space for how we used to operate because I just don't do what I used to do. Right. And so they look at me and they're proud but they also wish that they could have got themselves together too. No, these right. are friends from the neighborhood. Yeah. Gotcha. And you, you wish you had more time to spend with them, but that's just not the, the reality of it. You know what I'm right. saying? How and, much time well, did you go ahead? I'm sorry. No. It, um, and, and most of my homeboys, you know, we just, you know, you know, we just, it, like we've parted ways and, you know, I, my, my woman, I've been with the same woman 18 years, bro. Gotcha. And let, watching her graduate from college and then me subsequently ruining her life. And I go to prison and she pregnant with our daughter. So being somebody to her and being somebody to my family, uh, my immediate family, my brother, like my brother, my oldest brother is my biggest champion. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. He was the one who ripped around the streets and he wished that shit didn't happen with me, but it did. So being somebody to those people, that's like my everything. Mm -hmm. um, and for the other people, I'm not like one of those dudes who like, uh, just because I'm here and you there, I just understand, like, you know, I've been there and I've done so, work on myself to get the fuck out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, so you're having a LeBron moment now yeah. where you like certain shit just don't fit what I'm trying to do now. And now I have full control. I have a, a beautiful understanding of how this shit supposed to be. And, yeah. Uh, we, we may not be congruent, me and you. So I might have to, I still fuck with you. You still my nigga. However, I'm, I already did that shit. I'm over here now. With this year, yeah, but, here. but but I think it's important where I, I can so e even when I when we connected, I don't want to uh jump too far off a topic, right? But I can understand when people can feel there's no such thing as jumping far off topic. I'm fucked up, I've been in penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, ain't no fucking thing is jumping no topic here, bro. We just kicking it. We this yeah. ain't an interview, we just yeah, kicking so, shit. So, but but even when like when when I when, when I connected with you, I can mm -hmm. I see you do an interview. I can understand when I can hear intelligence through somebody. And you just know from being in the joint for so long, you could just like, I, I did four years, right? But you, yes. I'm in a closed security facility 
and you around niggas all day, you just all understand day. who somebody is. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And when I heard you talk, you just understand who can you can fit on this end of the spectrum, or you can fit on this end of the spectrum. Some people can't go but one place. You right. feel I'm coming from? And so the humor was, I said, man, it, it, it's it, it's my personality. It's the humor where I can be all the way left field, but then I can also Bring sit down home. with the most prominent people in the world gotcha. and gotcha. and have influence over there. So like, I get a kick out of that. That's what I was like. I like just me personally. I don't know what it is, but I said I don't know what this dude is about to do with this platform. But I think it goes somewhere. I don't right. know where it's gonna go. I don't know how it's gonna go. But it was just I was like. Just, just the energy. It's the energy, the force, the intelligence. Right. And, and whatever it is, I just think it's going somewhere. For whatever. Listen, bro, I'm shocked at this shit. <laughs> I, don't, I get paid to talk shit. I'm <laughs> fucked up by this shit. What? <laughs> you think you fucked up? I'm fucked up. You hear me? I never knew. If I would have knew hey. this shit, listen, brother. If I would have knew that my opinion and the way I express myself. Could have gotten me where I am now, and I'm not where I'm going to be. I'm getting booked like crazy with mm -hmm. everything right now, right? So that was I get fucking paid to talk shit. And but see, the thing is, is it's the truth of what I'm saying. We live in the world now where you have so much subterfuge and so much hidden agendas, and so many people who are not genuine. We, we have so many people who are not just miseducated, but undereducated. I always say. The biggest issue now, especially within the black community, is that a lot of these young black men and women, they, they don't they don't know what they don't know. They're clueless. So when they're put into a situation where they're supposed to react or respond, either good or bad, they don't know how to respond or react. Or you expecting motherfuckers to be able to cope with some shit who were never taught that mm -hmm. the shit they doing is not they don't know it's not right. I, I always tell a story about when I walk, I walk into, I walk into a mall and I saw a black woman and she was with her two sons who looked to be 15, 16 years old. She walking in front of them. They on their phone, four, five steps behind her. And she gets to the door. She opened the door, hold door for these sorry motherfuckers. And they walk <laughs> right in. They ain't got no money. She just spent her money. Right. So I'm not blaming her because it's the breakdown in the black male female relationship. It's the break breakdown of the black family structure. So that breakdown has a direct impact and effect on the children. A lot of these yeah. children don't know that they don't know. They're clueless. And so we expect them to be able to handle and deal and cope when they don't even realize that the shit they doing is not right. That's a 100%. big issue. Right. Um, what do you do now? Can you talk about what you do now and what your field of work is now? Yeah, so I do uh, a few different things. Uh, so one, entrepreneur, businessman, and just businessman at heart. Uh, the biggest thing that I do, and I'll just kind of go backwards uh, from uh, the thing that I do most to uh, gotcha. minimal. Uh, so I own um, medical facilities, uh, podiatric uh, foot and ankle centers throughout the state of Ohio, Gotcha. I own about 35 of them. And so everything from surgeries to regular routine care, all through mm -hmm. Toledo, through Central Ohio, through Northeastern Ohio, we have the largest uh, network of uh, podiatric practices. So uh, we've been doing that for a few years now, and we have had success. Uh, vascular surgery centers. So anybody who's looking to prevent amputations, we basically uh, help people to restore blood flow in their lower extremities all through their legs uh, so they can keep their toes, their feet, their ankles, and everything. And that nature, we have a few of those centers throughout the uh, state. It's three of them. Um, invest into real estate, you know, have about 200 units, uh, some commercial facilities, uh, some single families, some multi-families uh, through Northeast Ohio, some in Youngstown, some in Canton. Um, I got some properties here throughout Columbus, you know, where we house medical facilities and also your, your regular residents and our own treatment centers. So all things with uh, drug and alcohol treatment centers, mental health and drug and alcohol mm -hmm. centers. Um, I've been doing that since about 2016, mm -hmm. uh, where we house, you know, house a number of people coming from treatment centers, uh, detox facilities and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we work with adolescents. So we work with about 600 kids uh, on, a on a daily basis, literally inside of schools. Uh, with social workers, counselors, and, and that's probably what I'm most passionate about right. uh, because I think a lot of my stuff that um, that that I was really 
messed up around had more to do with not emotionally understanding how to control myself Got you. and uh, thinking is a skill and, you know, understanding that if you don't get the skill work of understanding how to think, understanding how to solve problems. Uh, when, when I was in prison, you know, I went through a bunch of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy courses, all yeah. that thinking for a change, cage of rage. I've been to uh, I've been cage rage as a motherfucker. Yeah, they got cage rage in Michigan too. Cage rage, you know what I'm saying? What they call this shit? I had cage rage. I had, God damn, I, had, I got all kinds of certificates and shit. Now, it ain't, yeah. now listen, I passed some courses of flying colors. And then went and crack a nigga in the head. <laughs> like, man, did you just graduate, uh, motherfucking cage of rage? I got the certificate. Like, I fuck with you, Maurice, because I got the cage. We brothers at heart. I got cage of rage too. I flashed that shit in flying colors and went and crack a nigga in the head the next goddamn day. Hey, look. So, so, so that's the field we got to live in when you leave right. the education wing, right? Right. So, absolutely. But, but the, the the core principles of how they trying to get you to think. If right. you impart on kids, I think it's like the greatest gift that you can give to them. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and and then I go I go around to uh, universities and colleges and high schools and you know just all different functions and it's it's really either telling my whole journey, telling parts of it uh, that may be relevant towards you know whoever invites me. Uh, but that's what I do. You know what I'm saying? And and it's it's my, um, and it, listen. Let me let me clap for you, brother, because. Hey, listen, I'm proud of you. And I don't know, I don't know if this means anything to you or not, but hey, listen, brother, the fact that you were able to take your circumstance and not allow it to defeat you, and the fact that you were able, because right now you sound like a lawyer, god damn it. You don't sound like <laughs> Maurice Claret, the football player, the, no. the, 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 the little young boy from Youngtown, Ohio, who fi you figured this shit out, bro. And I'm proud of you. Appreciate and, it. Like I said, I don't know if it means because we don't know each other. We just connected through social media, through my interviews. But I want you to know that I'm proud of you because in many respects, in many aspects, in many situations, black men who trip and fall, they don't know how to get up. No. And when they trip, they stay down and, they're, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, they want to wallow in the mud. But you've gotten back up and you are winning the fight, bro. I'm, I'm proud of you, man. From one hood nigga to another <laughs> hood nigga. She. <laughs> Uh, I, I fuck I'll with you, you my nigga. If you don't get no bigger type shit, you feel me? <laughs> yeah, I, I should have said that. I'm supposed to keep it professional. He warned me to keep it professional, but I had to slip that little shit in right there. You hear me? <laughs> so listen, bro. Uh, is there anything you want to say? Anybody you want to shout out? Is there anything that you want to say about anything? Now the I, stage is yours. I don't know. Uh, one thing I want to say, man. Just from time to time, I want to do this again, man. I think there's, gotcha. I think there's the introductory part. But, you know, if you go anywhere on the Internet, I've been inter interviewed by a lot of people. There's just a lot of information that you just don't get out to people right. because they don't understand it. You know what I'm right. saying? And I think like in, in some capacity, I wasn't joking when I said I think that your platform going to continue to grow. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a teaching element, you know, that people can grasp. Like people bring me into spaces to teach. Right. And, you know, who you engage with or who you have conversation with brings different sides of you out you know right, what I'm saying I feel like um like my, my fan base is niggas you know so like I got a huge I got right. I got a lot of people with fan bases but there's a lot of just people who I know that will be fans of you I, I this, this is what I feel I do right I feel that when people see me mature or I I I, I I've evolved when I get to, to get a chance to show it it gives them room and space to to live in that space you know what I'm right. saying Absolutely. and 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 I only want my life to be like that. Like I laugh, I joke, I talk shit, and all this other stuff. But the the whole journey is just maturing, growing, having fun, enjoying life. And um, you know, I don't I don't have some big thought out message. I say, you know, if it's anybody on this platform, uh, I do a show with uh, Cam and Mace. You know, every week we do a sports show. To, uh, it gotcha. is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. I'm yeah, a fan. We, we laugh, I'm a fan. Yeah, we laugh right. and joke and have a good time. And if you haven't checked it out, check it out. If you just want to laugh and joke and be a formal sports. Well, I'm a but. fan. I watched this shit. And when and Cam and Mace got that deal, right? I was rooting for him. So when you talk to them, tell them this Detroit motherfucker, penitentiary motherfucker. I'm man, listen, bro. Whenever I see a black man doing anything, right, outside of what they think we can do, man, I, I salute that shit. I ain't no nowhere near no motherfucking hater. Right. So when I seen that you were part of the show, god damn it, who better? Who better who understands the ups and downs and the vicissitudes of life to be able to come in and contribute to what they already have? That's a major move. I salute that. I salute them. Well, no, for believing I tell you like this. 
It was Cam. Like, just think about this. I was around when he was really in Ohio, moving around and getting right. in. And that's when I was at the, the height of my career. But he had hit me up over the summer, and he was like, yo, bro, like, I want you to be a part of this. And I was like, man, of course I was going to say yeah and understood what it was about because I had watched it before. Right. Uh, but I, I think, like, just showing that man gratitude. Like, he didn't, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to pull me into that platform uh, I, I got like even that, just being at a different place in life where you're grateful and sincerely grateful. Like, just yeah, like absolutely. that's the key. Sincerely yeah, yo, on. bro. Like, you know, right. you, he could have picked anybody in the world to be like, yo, I want you to be a part of your show. And then you'd be like, yo, I have something that's that's on me. Like, you know, the, the, the good Lord is on me and I got favor where he said, hey, man, let me be a part of this. And he created the platform and he said, hey, man, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, however you want to say it whatever you want to bring to the show, bring it. And just like with him, like my personality came out because I know who I'm talking to. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. And then talking to you, like I know who I'm talking to from watching interviews to you, but I can't go everywhere and talk like this just because you get it. You know, just I, the space is not provided. Right. So this, so so this space for me, I'm providing the space for a motherfucker that it, we ain't just it ain't just about keeping it real, bro. It's about yeah. having a genuine conversation amongst people who have been through shit. When you've yeah. been through shit and you, we've been blessed enough to make it out of that shit. Yeah, bro. It's, I'm I'm so appreciative of where I am in life right now. You you I don't even know how to really express it because my life could have been something altogether different. I thank you, brother. This is part one. Of a series, if you'll come back and so we can yeah. chop it up about all we can, we can kick it about sports, it ain't got to be about no, we, we can talk about we can talk about some shit now. You hear me? <laughs> Don't get me fucking started, man. Maurice Claret, I want to thank you for coming on Dog Face TV, sponsored by Mogul State of Mind. Shout out to D, shout out to the whole squad. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Have a beautiful day. Got you. I look, I'm about to go get the bed. I used to be in the bed about nine o'clock. Oh, we old men, we old, we old. <laughs> it might be a time too. I'm being summoned. <laughs> but it might be a time too. You ain't the only one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so hey, right. listen, we're we gonna do it again. You got my number, man. Uh it's yep. all love. I enjoy your content, all of the stuff that you put out. And like I said, I hope this thing grows. Hopefully you can edit it correctly. And uh whenever you uh oh, we're coming right, we're coming right, we're coming right, we ain't playing. Yeah, <laughs> we coming so, correct. When you see, hey, like, yeah, dog on point. Hey, I tell you this: I did an interview with the Pivot, right? Right. And after I did it with the Pivot, they actually gave me something that I should give to you. So, when they were, what, what I found out about them from doing the show with them, it's not necessarily the show; it's the amount of content that they produce after to produce the show. Right. And so, this lady gave me a Dropbox. Did you got a Dropbox? Yes, sir. So I'm going to shoot you. Uh, I got to find it. Her name is Alicia. She's the producer of the show. So what they end up having, like, so they shoot the show and it comes out on Monday or right. I think like Monday at 12 o'clock and every single day between graphics, between clips, everything was produced. And so I said, oh, these dudes just have a consistent system of how they promote a show professionally. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's cold. And I think like, you know, for whatever it's worth, I don't know what you do now. But I think it'll be like a value to you if you just looked at the structure of hey, it. Listen, send it to me. So Mogul State of Mind, this pr whole thing is is produced executive produced by Mogul State of Mind. He's uh I'm in Detroit right now. He's in Dallas producing this show that we see right now. When oh. you see, yeah. So and then, and then he has a connection with Sean Cotton and Say Cheese. They share the same multimedia space out in Dallas, Texas. So he's the one who actually blessed me with this oh. opportunity to have my own YouTube live show. So when you see this motherfucker, we ain't motherfucking playing. Ain't gonna play. <laughs> we ain't on no, no hood nigga shit. We professionals. Hey, all right. Well, well look, I, I didn't know, but I, I do it to me. It's on popping, brother. Say, trust me. I wouldn't have wasted you your time. Cheese, it's gonna be proper. That's all I know. Yeah, Mogul State of Man. Hey, listen, the family is all good. That was Big D. He's the owner of it. He he initiated the shit. He came and got me and said, bro. I didn't know you could talk like that. I just thought you was a cussing, fussing ass nigga. When he interviewed me the first time, he's like, shit, if I would have knew this, we would have been doing getting this shit in like this, bro. But uh, on that note, man, I want to thank you for coming. Salute. Have a good night. Peace and blessings right. to your family, brother. Yeah, have a good one.